Hello and welcome to The Broken Sword. Today we are looking at the dragons of Middle-earth. First of all, I hope you all had a great Christmas and Boxing Day. This has obviously been recorded in advance, but by the time this comes out you should hopefully all be full, together and happy. But now we are in that timeless void of a period between Christmas and people going back to work and school in the New Years, I thought why not look at something that we have been asked to cover in greater detail quite a few times. The dragons. Because you know, dragons are Christmassy, right? There are several great dragons from the histories of Middle-earth with the likes of Smaug, Glaurung and Ancalagon the Black probably being the most well known of those. Smaug is the dragon that we get from the adventures of the Hobbit and was the greatest fire breathing dragon of the Third Age, who we have put out a video on before so please check that out if you would like a full story on him. But then we have Glaurung who was the first of all the dragons and was one of Morgoth's main leaders back in the First Age. He was different to Smaug in that he did not have wings, therefore obviously could not fly, but he was also a fire breather. Then as for Ancalagon the Black, he was another of Morgoth's dragons and was actually considered to be the greatest winged dragon and in turn the greatest of all the ages. He was not revealed until the War of Wrath where Ancalagon drove back the forces of the host of the Valar until he was stopped by Eärendil and the Great Eagles. But the question we are looking at more today is just where did these dragons come from? Well, we have already had our first hint towards an answer and that is from my description of Glaurung. He was said to be the first of the dragons, meaning that he was the first to ever at least make an appearance in the first age. But could you say that they were really created as such? Or does it not quite work like that? Well, Tolkien's version of what create means may not be exactly the same as what you think. After all, in Tolkien's universe the only entity that possesses creation ability is that of Eru Iluvatar. After all, Eru's thoughts are what created all of the universe inside of Tolkien's thoughts, which included Arda, in other words, Earth. Even when we look at the music of the Ainur, all this did was give physical form to Eru's creations, not create from nothing as such. So, like we have said, all of the masterworks of the Valar and the Alves were not acts of creation, but transformations of pre-existing things. If we look at a couple of specific examples now. So to start with we will look at the Valar Yavanna, who was known as the Queen of the Earth. She did not strictly speaking create the two trees of Valinor, Laurelin and Talperion. She merely incarnated a theme of the great music into physical form by transforming some of the secret fire into light. Another example is with the Valar Varda, who was known as the Queen of the Valar. She did not create the stars and the constellations, she merely transformed light from the two trees into new forms. And then I'll give you one more with the Valar Aule, who was known as the Smith of the Valar. He did not create the race of the dwarves, he merely transformed the earth into these humanoid looking things. It was only after that had been done against Eru's ways that Eru himself alone could genuinely create a new race of sentient beings, basically the part which gives them a soul. If we look at someone not even with the power of the Valar as well maybe, we could look at the greatest alven craftsman called Feanor and his greatest achievement of the Silmarils. As he did not create the Silmarils out of nothing, he merely took the light of the two trees and material of the earth and transformed them into a new shape. I feel and hope really like you probably get the point that I'm trying to make by now. So let's get back to the question at hand. It is similar in a way that Morgoth did not create the dragons, he merely corrupted existing sentient creatures through a series of long and torturous efforts of his Valor life force and then turned them into the final form of dragons. And again, hopefully we're all keeping up with this and it all makes sense to you. If we look a bit more into this though and we dive into the Silmarillion, specifically chapter 3 of the coming of the elves and the captivity of Malkor, it says, but already the oldest living things had arisen, in the seas and the great weeds, and on earth the shadow of great trees, and in the valleys of the night clad hills, there were dark creatures, old and strong. So 
Already it was set up that there were creatures here capable of being corrupted, and strong ones asked that. And as we look into the next section of this same chapter about Malkor's plans, it says, But in the north Malkor built his strength, and he slept not, but watched and laboured. And the evil things that he had perverted walked abroad, and the dark and slumbering woods were haunted by monsters and shred and shapes of dread. And in Utumo he gathered his demons about him, those spirits who first adhered to him in the days of his splendour, and became most like him in his corruption. Their hearts were of fire, and they were cloaked in darkness, and terror went before them. They had whips of flame, Balrogs they were named in Middle Earth in later days. And in that dark time Malkor bred many other monsters of divers shapes and kinds that long troubled the world, and his realm spread now ever southward over Middle Earth. So, as it says, Malkor perverted those evil things, he changed them, he manipulated them, and not long after we get more of a description again from the same chapter. Green things fell sick and rotted, and rivers were choked with weeds and slime, and fens were made, rank and poisonous, the breeding place of flies, and forests grew dark and perilous, the haunts of fear, and beasts became monsters of horn and ivory, and dyed the earth with blood. Then the Valar knew indeed that Malkor was at work again, and they sought for his hiding place. And of this section there is one part we are reminded of and return to later, as for when Morgoth began to suffer defeat at the hands of the elves in Beleriand, he realised he needed to challenge them with more than just orcs. Orcs were useful servants and could be produced in number, but they lacked that unmatchable power that he truly needed to succeed in the war. Therefore, using his valour power, he took those monsters of horn and ivory, and using his corruption and manipulation, he brought forth the one known as Glaurum, the first of the Uraloki, which is the name in Quenya that was given to the fire drakes of the north. But as we know, although Glaurum was the first, he was not necessarily the greatest, and despite even ruling the once realm of Nargothrond at one point as the Dragon King, Glaurum would fall at the hands of a man, Turin Taramba. So from here Morgoth had to try this again, this time improving on Glaurum to spawn a new variety, this time with wings. Flight could be a game changer in the war, it could be a way to combat the eagles of Manwe and tighten his grip over Middle Earth, and the greatest of these would be the dragon known as Ancalagon the Black. One other theory of the dragons could come from that they were possibly once Maiar who took the forms of lizard-like creatures. After all, most of the Maiar that followed Malkor were corrupted and took the forms of the fiery demons known as the Balrogs, so it could be plausible that some maybe took the forms of dragons instead, or at least some kind of lizard-like creature as well, as this could be considered in the same way that there is also a theory that there was a Maiar who took the form of a giant spider which turned out to be Ungoliant. Therefore, in the same way that the great spider Ungoliant ended up with children who were lesser spiders, which ended up with the likes of Shelob in the Third Age, the same idea could then be used for the dragons. And this idea comes from that Amaya's power would be diminished through generations of children, but yet still be very powerful. Which is why it is possible that even though a dragon like Smaug was great, Smaug's power was considered to be little compared to the great stories of the likes of Glaurung and Ancalagon back in the First Age. But at the end of the day, there is not really much of anything to back up this theory, so it is far less likely, even to the point that the idea of Ungoliant being a Maya is very unlikely too, so it is a hard defence to argue, but at the end of the day, it could still be fun to consider an idea or two that may not be completely accurate, just interesting to consider. So there we have it, a dive into just how the dragons were more or less likely to have been created in Middle Earth. I know the idea of corruption and manipulation can still be a bit vague, there's not really much specific about it apart from the idea that some kind of valor magical power is behind it all. So I do hope you found some of the answers you were looking for here, or at least enough information to make up your own mind on the matter. I do love the subject of dragons, so I very much doubt that this will be the last of the videos we do that covers them. Perhaps a video looking at the different types of them next, who knows? So I hope you all enjoyed this video for today, and this leads me to my question for you all today, and that is, how do you believe the dragons truly came into existence? Do you think that they were perverted Maya? 
Do you think they were simply other creatures corrupted and improved by Malkor's power? Or maybe that they were actually there all along and Malkor just boosted them up? Or perhaps you think something completely different, maybe because there might be something I haven't mentioned in this video. Well, please let me know all of your thoughts and opinions on this in the comment section below. Now firstly I will quickly mention our other channels which will of course be linked in the description below and also to shout out our amazing patrons. Firstly we have our Divine Power tier members of Kevin, Abram and Matt, you are all awesome. And a big thanks to our Fire Demon tier members of Nasheath, Denversteel and Gregory. And as well I cannot forget the Wizard Staff tier members of John, Andrew and Finrod Felagund as well. You are all true legends of the Brohirrim. Finally, again, I hope you all had an incredible Christmas this year and you will join us in celebrating Tolkien going into 2022. If you have managed to reach the end of the video with me today and you have enjoyed what you've seen, then please hit that subscribe button and the bell icon too so that you could be notified of all of our future uploads. So thank you once again if you have managed to reach the very end of the video with me and I will see you next time on The Broken Sword.